the the reason Richard came onto our radar is because he uh, he dug deep and tried to find out that he's in a crisis. When that crisis was in the engine bay when A380, 69 people on board, the front lines must have been breathtaking. Richard talks about leadership, teamwork, and skill. Let's hear his story, Richard. Over to you. back at Ralston, I was here last year, place is growing, it's a really keen group of people, aviators and, and enthusiasts to get here, and we've got a response to this, we've got to keep, all of us have to uh, keep this trend increasing. Coral, my wife Coral, can you stand up, Coral to the back here, and the, the she must, we've been to um, Oshkosh, which is really where this place is aspiring to be, uh, and 16,500 aircraft flying in. And it's great to be here, but it's coming up to 50 years, 50 year anniversary of a remarkable event. 20 July 1969, what was it? Moon landing. Moon landing, Neil Armstrong gets on the moon. And you think, well, maybe that was pretty good. And the budget was either 10 billion or 100 billion, I can't quite. I've asked Jean Cran, so Colin and I have just recently spent that with we can't work out the difference, but there was almost no budget. 50 years ago, 10 billion is still a phenomenal amount of money. And, and they had 400,000 people working together to get a man on the moon. And you thought it went pretty smoothly, but actually it didn't. What you may not be aware of is that the command module was attached to the lunar lander, and they had to, they had to crawl between both. And the, so they were pressurized. And before they had to separate the lunar lander to land, they had to depressurize the lunar lander. And they forgot. So when they separated, there was a slight push, and the push gave a, a delta V, a delta velocity, and over a period of a few orbits, the displacement increased. By the time they started the lunar landing, they were 25 feet per second in error uh, of a 50, 50 foot per second abort. In other words, they're halfway to abort when Neil started the descent. But as you're aware, during the descent, 20,000, uh, early in the descent, he realised he was high, but then he started getting these error warnings, 12.01, 12.02, he didn't know what they were, the, the busy trying to control the machine. It was meant to be an auto land. It was never going to work. The auto land would have put it into a, into a rock or boulder field inside a crater. He had to disconnect the auto land. You know, all the things they planned for is fine, what they ended up with, with 500 million people watching on Earth, Neil was navigating all these risks, all these unexpected things. They built four lunar lander training vehicles. You see, the lunar lander was a fly-by-wire. It was the first digital fly-by-wire machine in the universe. What was the first analog? We'll see, see if you can answer that at the end of the talk. They built four lunar lander training vehicles to see how they could fly the fly-by-wire. They crashed through on Earth. But Neil Armstrong said they gave a lot of confidence. <laughs> In the simulator, two weeks before the Apollo 11, they simulated all these different kinds of things. They actually simulated something that ended up in a 1201-1202 era, and the team aborted In the simulator, everyone said abort. They never told Neil or Buzz Aldrin about these errors. So when Neil got them coming down to descent, these were truly significant events. How did he get down? He landed on the moon 50 years ago. This is a definition of resilience, to recover when things go wrong. Imagine you hit a, you're driving down this country road and you hit a problem, a big pothole or a big, let's say you hit a rock. The suspension will take up the load and then the dampener's leg will come down at a slow rate. This is what resilience is. When something goes wrong, you absorb the impact. You might have to change what you do, recoil like a spring. But then when the situation goes, you recover. So resilience is recovering when things go wrong. And Neil Armstrong truly was one of the best examples of humanity of resilience. And I've written about that in my, in my second book. So when we talk about resilience, this is something everyone's got to have. You're not born with it. There are eight parts. You see, I, I was tested many times 
in aviation with the Air Force. I, jumped, I met someone two weeks ago and they said when we were flying in the summer, do you remember we had that Indian problem we had to land in the desert? And there was something different to what I remember and I'd totally forgotten it. So I've, I've had lots of engine problems, lots of different problems. I've, I've been in the airline and now I've had three engine failures in that airline. I've been a passenger with two of those failures. You see, the, the, the engines today are so reliable that only one in four and a half pilots on quad aircraft will ever experience an engine failure. Only one in four and a half. So how do you practice to be resilient when you're not actually going to be subjected to it? Because I actually, I firmly believe that being proficient in something is not enough. You can't be competent without experience. You can't be competent without experience. A good pilot is a pilot who has been scared. <laughs> and a dangerous pilot is one who hasn't experienced fear. But I faced QF32 and we survived. It wasn't because of me. It was because of the team effort. There were eight teams, the pilots, the cabin crew, air traffic controllers, policemen, firemen, the ground staff, the Qantas Crisis Centre, and even the passengers, because we kept them informed during the QF32 event. And they took part. When somebody's mobile phone went on the when their mobile phone rang on the ground, while we're sitting there for two hours in the hot Singapore sun, four tons of jet fuel pooling underneath the aircraft, it was the passengers who yelled out to that other passenger, or the passengers yelled out, turn that phone off. Many teams made QF32 resilient. And I was here last year and I talk, talked about the experience and this is the what happened, the what of QF32, which is a true story of a, a team resilience. But my life changed. I used to have black hair. <laughs> I, but I, I joined Qantas thinking, I hope when I retire, that, that someone would say, the Crippney retired last week, and someone would say, well, who was he? And, and I sort of failed. But, but we succeeded because all the difficult work we did, the lifetime of learning, all the elements of resilience to pilots put in, in both the private and the commercial aspect, all the elements of that resilience came to being and we, and we passed. So it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about it. Um, in, the, in the eight years since QF32, I've toured pretty well the world. Cora and I have toured everywhere. We've been to Oshkosh and spoken at Oshkosh. And now what I try and do is I talk about the elements of resilience. And this is a really big topic. You know, resilience is personal and corporate. How do you personally survive when things go wrong? One of the biggest threats to your personal resilience is divorce. Because divorce is an um, emotional and a financial stress in your life. Um, and if we just put as much effort into our marriage as we put into our work, if we accept that change is the natural part of business life and our personal life, the person you, that you're in love with and you married 20 years ago, they've changed, but you've changed. We, our goal is to be in a formation in our marriage to change with our partner and keep in tight formation. If we stay married, that's half of our life's financial problems resolved. So something as simply as staying married is part of personal resilience. There are a whole lot more, but then we have the corporate resilience. But the interesting thing is there are eight key elements of resilience. I wrote about them in the second book. It took four years to research. I do not recommend anyone write a book on resilience because it is, it is unending. It's never, it's, it's boundless. The eight elements are knowledge, training, experience, teamwork, leadership, crisis management, decision making, decision making and risk. And I also include post-traumatic stress. And I think everyone here, sometime in their life, has suffered post-traumatic stress. And it's important. Half the questions that I, I read about post-traumatic stress in three pages here, half the questions about QF32 was about the stress that I went through after the event. You see, post-traumatic stress is, is an evolutionary process to help us survive. It is a benefit to us. It, it means if there was a line outside this door, we would remember it and not come back to this, this hang-up. It has good functions to help us survive. But if we can't process that stress and put it in the context of other life experiences, if we're to talk about it, we don't grieve about it, women are better than this. It, 
will stay in our memories, comes back every night as nightmares, and haunt us forever. The suicide rate of military veterans is three times the normal civilian rate. I didn't realize when I wrote this book that half the pilots I talked about in this book later called me and said, thank you for talking about post-traumatic stress. I've been having nightmares half my life. If someone tells you they have post-traumatic stress, believe them. It takes vulnerability and humility to admit it. Trust them, believe them, and help them. And there is a positive outcome. Richard Branson said that through failures, the failures of these stepping stones to success, there can be success from failure. People who have never taken a risk and failed have actually never probably done anything at all. So failure is part of taking risks and making decisions. But in post-traumatic stress, there can be growth from trauma. And I know that half the people, well, statistically half of you all here are still suffering from post-traumatic stress from some event. And there can be growth from trauma. You can recover from it. You just need to know how. So the first chapter in flying is about uh, neuroscience, the brain. The brain we have isn't necessarily the best brain. It happens to, it's a pretty good thing that's evolved. We, we, can, we have the prehistoric brain, the, the amygdala and the thalamus. The amygdala is the emotional sensor, the emotional smoke detector for our life. It detects things that are bad, like a pair of eyes in the grass, maybe that's a lion. It detects the face of our partner, anything <coughs> emotional. And the amygdala is critical at giving us the fear response of fight, flight, and um, freeze. Because when things go wrong, there's a big explosion now, 15% of you would do something correct, 15, 70% of you will follow the herd, and 15% of you, you will do something that will inhibit your survival. This is a fear response. And so if something goes wrong, that's truly, that activates your amygdala and your fast brain, the subconscious, gives your gut feeling something's wrong, I don't like it, fight, fly, play dead. This is what you don't want in your light aircraft when something goes bad. Because the amygdala and the fear response that helps the alligator or the hawk, the horse run away or the rabbit run away or the dog that's afraid of thunder, it's not very good when using high-tech electronics and big equipment. So we have to learn to survive the startle effect. You will still shake. You see, the amygdala detects the response. There are four million nerves coming into your brain. And the amygdala has a high speed connection to most of them. It will, the amygdala will, will get the sense within 20 milliseconds. It'll give a response within 50 milliseconds. Your cortex won't give you a response. So the outside of your brain, the, the new brain that makes us intelligent, it's slow. It won't register an input for half a second or 500 milliseconds. So for the first, after 100 milliseconds, your body's responding to the fear response. Fear response is building, and you're not even conscious of it yet. So if you're in the air, if you're doing anything critical, you have to survive that startle effect. In aviation, we have a term called a V8. Help me. Navigate, communicate. And this is the, the purpose of this is to get us through the startle effect when your body either wants to shut down, poo itself, or, or just run away in fear. Aviate means stay alive. If you're a soldier, keep your head down. If you're in a building and an airplane flies into it, get out of the building. Stay alive. Um, in an aircraft, fly the airplane. Don't worry about the problem, just make sure the airplane's flying. That's what we did on Cubic 32. Navigate. Give yourself a plan. And it's probably getting out of the burning building. But navigate, just give your plan for the next 20 or 30 seconds. Keep yourself, find a safe place to go to. Maybe get out of your house if it's on fire, and then communicate. Then you tell someone about it. So aviate, navigate, communicate is a vital part of, of surviving the fear response. That's what we had on QF32 when all these explosions happen and the top panels see a red light, the, the buzzers going off with sirens. We cancelled them, they kept coming back. They kept coming back, we couldn't stop the sirens. It just kept going for minutes upon minutes, and very distracting in the background. We kept our composure, we aviated, navigated, communicated, and then slowly the slow cortex, the slow brain, the conscious brain comes online and gives you a path. 
if you know what it is. If you've been scared before, if you know what your priorities are, if you've been trained to do these things, if you slow brain can tell your amygdala, you know what, I've been here, I've been in a simulator, I've thought about this, I've read about this, I know what happens and I know what to do. So here we come with the other elements of resilience. There's knowledge, knowing what to do. We have to read about things. Many people get into a car, all they know about the car and the engine is they turn the key and the engine starts. It could be a gas turbine engine, it could be an electric motor, they don't care. Turn the key, it starts. In aviation, we have to know things down to our foundation roots. We have, you see, when the car breaks down, you can pull over and call for help or get towed away. You can't do that in aeroplanes. You may not be able to do it when the crisis meets you. You might have to do something to stay alive. This needs knowledge. And as you get the base foundations, then you get the trunk, the branches of extra information. And finally, all the nice stuff is all the leaves. But you can't have the full umbrella of knowledge without the root foundations to revert back to. And I see a lot of it here in the country. The people, the, the child, kids have been practicing on motorbikes, riding motorbikes, they ride horses. They have to learn how the machinery works. These are learning the base foundations for, for many things in life that you might need one day to survive. So maybe if the car breaks down, the best person to help you get it going again will be someone from the country. It also means that you have to have creative destruction. Your brain is basically full the whole time. Certainly mine is. Anything that comes in displaces something that I then lose. So you have to get rid of the old information to make way for the new. And you must keep reading. Creative destruction. Knowledge is a life. It's a life you have to... You must commit to a lifetime of learning. I'll talk about that shortly. Training. How do you train yourself? How do you... How do you keep the best you can be? Bear in mind if you're a, a surgeon, once you're checked by the College of Surgeons to practice, you are never checked again. Now you do have to do courses, you have to go to Aspen and attend a lecture at 7 in the morning before you go to skiing. These are courses of attendance. But they're not really, in aviation, in my airline, the pilots are recertified seven times a year. We have four times to simulate two types of emergencies and a, and a route check. If we fail any of those seven certification checks, our license stops, we cease training, and our pay drops to half. When every person turns up to work in my airline, we know everything that's been published that we need to know. It, there is no excuse for ignorance. And we're checked on. If you're not being checked all the time, how do you build it up? How do you, how do you train yourself to be resilient? You, the, the answer is in another part of FLY, where I talk about deliberate practice. It means not practicing the easy things that we take for granted, practicing things that are hard, difficult, effortful things that give you feedback. We've got a friend who's a concert pianist. He practices five hours a day for two hours of deliberate practice. The things that are hard, the things that he, that, that he really doesn't want to do, but he pushes his boundaries all the time. He's always challenging himself and pushing further. In a simulator, uh, three, when a simulator is, 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 is valid up to about 30 knots of crosswind. And often we get checked to say 20 knots. I say, no, I want to go to 30 knots. And I don't care if I have to repeat it again or again. My aim is to get to the limits and then go beyond so that I'm confident that when things are bad in the airplane, I won't get nervous. Practice the hard things, then everything becomes easy. That's called deliberate practice. And then I take it one step further with the term deliberate, uh, stress proof deliberate practice, which means practicing something that is difficult until you, you don't react to your logic. Your pulse doesn't increase. Um, you're, you're, you don't sweat. All the stress. Training. Experience. Experience is wonderful. We've all graduated, we've all just passed pilots. Training, we've got a license. And isn't life wonderful? Yes, it is. And that's about as good as you're going to ever be unless you go and carry out deliberate practice. Because if you don't keep your experience levels increasing, then your experience will tail off. If you're in a profession that needs knowledge, your, your knowledge will become a uh, legacy. Your skills will drop. There will be a skills gap. So experience. Well, let's put it in perspective. 
there, I did a graph that showed accident rates in aviation versus flying hours. And it conveniently showed a graph. It was actually exponential. The first uh, up to 1,000 hours, that was where your risks were the highest. And then it came down linearly to almost zero um, at 25,000 hours. So it looked like, yeah, the, the, the you know, survival rate as a pilot is related to experience. But when I showed that at a conference, the head of the ATSB said, no, Richard, you're wrong. There's something missing. There's, a, there's, a, a, there's an aspect that comes in where experience builds over confidence. People think they know it all. I've seen it all. You can't tell me anything. I don't like this new technology. I don't need to know about it. And so often, for many trades, mining, medicine, aviation, experience can be a curse. It's a curse. Unless you understand that the knowledge is time limited, you actively destroy old knowledge, you, do, you commit to a lifetime of learning and you build new experiences, experience will be a curse that might come back to bite you. When, you know, there's an old pilot, an old pilot, but there are no old, old pilots. A pilot like a ship is only ever as good as its last flight. So that they have, however you could you think I might be, I'm very conscious that tomorrow I'll make a terrible mistake. The minute you think you know it all in aviation is a second before you do something really stupid. <clears throat> uh, knowledge, training, experience, teamwork. I did have leadership and teamwork. The chapters committed together in one chapter until Donald Trump got elected president <laughs> and I had to split them. But you truly can't be resilient without teamwork. In this high-tech world where there's lots of inputs and no one knows everything, the team is the only way to build resilience. And you must build teams, so I discuss teamwork. Leadership, there are many forms of teamwork. There are narcissistic leaders, and I say you can never be resilient if you're a narcissistic leader. And I, 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 when I write, it is impossible to be resilient if you're a narcissistic leader. But I discuss leadership. Crisis management, knowing how to protect your brand. So, who's protected their brand very well? BP in the Mexican Gulf? No. Very good. Um, Richard Branson, many events, Cambria train crashed. He had the space, the Galactica air aircraft explosion. His crisis management is superb. What about Boeing's crisis management? These can destroy companies. The share price of Rolls Royce and Airbus reduced 5% up to QX32. They quickly recovered. The crisis management by, by airline was, was phenomenal. Alan Joyce asked his engineer, do you know what happened? The engineer, with QX32, the engineer said, I think, but not fully. He said, can you guarantee this won't happen again? The engineer said, no. Alan Joyce said, ground the fleet of A380s around the world and ground 10,000 passengers who wanted to fly home. That's bold. And it was courageous, it was the right thing to do, and it protected the company brand. Decision making. Critical part. We make decisions all the time. There are many ways to make decisions that I discuss in the book. Some can be almost instantaneous. You can have you can have instincts you're born with, you can have habits that you train, you can have intuition, which is like compiled decisions that you've made. So firemen have really good intuition from lots of experience. Then you have long decision-making processes. We need to understand how the slow brain works, the cortical brain, with the amygdala that says, I just want to get home. I just want to get home. I'm nearly home. Let's land in the fog, right? You have to understand the forces at play, the biases, the illusions. That's in me. Um, one of the great things, you know, this world is not a perfect place. One of the key things, if you make a decision, and then you have a plan for rolling it out. If you find that things don't go planned, if you find that you are surprised, if you find that the data that you made the decision on maybe wasn't correct, in aviation, you make that decision again, or you will probably die. So aviation, we make decisions all the time. We remake them if we're wrong. If we're surprised, it doesn't go to plan, or we had incorrect data to start. Where do you put Brexit into this equation? And I have one minute to go. Decision making, um, post-traumatic stress. 
And, and that's basic, these are the elements of resilience. They're very deep subjects, but everything sits in the book on top of the neuroscience of the brain because the brain is how we relate to the world. It has benefits, it has limitations. And if we understand our brain, then all the elements of resilience, which is knowledge and training, experience, teamwork, leadership, crisis management, decision-making, decision and risk. Oh, that's the last 30 seconds on risk. Life is full of disruptions. Robotics, energy, transformation, 3D printing, new materials, more. The world is changing so fast. Well, guess what? You have to disrupt yourself and keep control. Otherwise, if you don't disrupt me, someone is going to disrupt you, and you will have no control, and you're going to feel like a sorry victim. These changes are coming. Sentient robots, robots that will have thought and awareness, consciousness and prediction. Do they scare you? Well, if there's a war tomorrow, and someone said they want you to send your son or daughter or a robot to war, who would you rather send? So sentient robots are coming. When the winds of change blow, don't build walls, build windmills. Harness disruption. Accept it. Accept you're going to have to change. Charles Darwin didn't say that the most fittest survive. Charles Darwin said that those who adapt survive. With the disruptions we face today, bit of windmills, harness it, make decisions, some will work, some won't. Accept you're going to fail. Fail fast. Don't persist with a dead horse. Fail well. Accept that failure is a stepping stone to success. Stand up. Learn, adjust, retry. Welcome failure as a stepping stone to success. This is what we must do if we're going to harness the disruptions. We must accept failure, fail fast, fail well. And then we build the elements of resilience. And we won't just survive. When we build the elements of resilience and practice all this stuff, we won't just survive the next catastrophe. But in the good times, we will absolutely thrive. Thank you. Um, and he said to me, I'm writing a new book, it's coming. But he said to me, there is never been a better time to be in aviation. Now, there are a lot of people in aviation who use over-regulation, all sorts of difficulties. Some are even saying, give it away. Um, Richard's right. And not only is he right about aviation, he's right about life. I just found what he had to say then enormously, enormously encouraging and inspirational. Um, today we won't lecture unless anybody had forgotten it. Um, the fact of it is we're going to get a government whether we like it or not and I just say Richard's saying you've got a choice, half glass full, half glass empty. He's a half glass full man. Let's embrace whatever comes today whether you like it or not and let's just be up there. Let's just go for it. Let's be positive about our lives. There were so many messages here that Richard gave us. Uh, grab his book or both these books, he'll be signing books up at the clubhouse, he'll have a bunch of books there for sale. Uh, support what he's doing, support yourself, do yourself a favour, buy his books, they're great. And I just want to thank you again, Richard, so much for being here today. It's an honour. <laughs>